Life is sweet Let it sweep you off your feet Hi, this is Allie. And this week we are back with the uh, incredibly interesting, wonderful storyteller, layer upon layer of uh, things that will pull us in and make us, Tom, you're just a guy that people want to know more about. Welcome back, Tom Locke. Yeah, thank you. Great to be here, Allie. Yeah, I... Um, you know, I, I was I was looking at some of the things you did. So, I mean, you're an author, uh, you're a mathematician, and then you came from Toronto to Vancouver and dropped yourself into the middle of the film industry. Yeah. How did how did how did that work for the mathematician? <laughs> well, it, you know, how I got there is probably you know the thing, and this is the the great twists and turns in life and taking advantage of of opportunities it's all life's all about choices i think yeah. we all can agree with that and and a little bit of luck again never hurt anybody right and like the boy scout be prepared so fortunately right. i was in 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 a lot of ways well what happened was uh, during my tenure and after i finished uh, my math degree in mathematics i flipped over to the uh, mba program at york university as well and did my mba at the same time, while I was uh, articling for Deloitte, Haskins, and Sells in the in accountancy business. Now, I had no desire to be a, a CPA, you know, at the time. But I was smart enough to realize that the exposure to all these businesses by going out and doing audits and all these things was incredible. So I did things from stock markets to grain feeding uh, places. But I ended up in one location with a company called Ampex. That's spelled A-M-P-E-X. Yes. Now, Ampex were the producers of very high-end professional audio and video equipment that would be used in uh, audio studios for music, uh, on TV, for TV, for your you know, videotape replays and all that stuff. All that stuff was Ampex stuff. And for the Olympics and that, all the big machines that were used there to record you know, the Olympics, send them back to scrim that company was was Ampex. Ampex also, also had the tape. So they had the razor blades, if you will, for that audio and, and video. And they had small cassettes, too. People may remember the Ampex. Yeah, cassettes, I remember the name. Yeah. The video yeah. and stuff. They were headquartered in Redwood City, California, near San Francisco. And so they were one of our clients. Well, as usually happens, they, they went in uh, into a situation saying, Hey, we're replacing uh, our financial area in this company in Canada, in Apex Canada. Uh, would you consider it? So, it was my choice. So, I, I left Deloitte's and joined Ampex Canada there. And with my music background, and that was great because Ampex also had a music division, which was winding down, you know, at, the, at that time. So, it helped wind that down and working with the people. But my deal was, I said, and they're surprised by this. I said, I'll come in and work with you guys i want to continue finishing off my my mba and but i want to take it all back that time i want the personnel department uh, under my thing of course all the other managers are good yours <laughs> we, we don't want to gee whiz but yeah i found out early life guess from my days of playing team sports for, for years that if you could put the team together if you had the team together it's amazing what you can accomplish one, one person's not going to do it so I took over that whole part and, you know, started working on bringing the people with the various departments together uh, as a team. That was one of my uh, outside goals and also cleaning up all the small things from a um, uh, mathematical side or anything, analytics side, Deloitte side of things that were wrong uh, that or needed attention in, in, in the company. It, it was then actually I discovered just to digress a bit that I was left brained and right brained um i could i was analytical but i had this creative side of me so i started working with the sales department and created an area of financial marketing where i would go up with the sales team selling this to the various studios and that and then i would sit down with their uh, finance people and creatively figure out how to finance this thing or how they should approach the banks moving forward so this is where financial marketing uh, came to be for me in, in that right. company so so how do i get to the west coast so three of the guys in our company top engineers sales guys and that uh decided to set up a post-production facility 
in Vancouver. What was happening over the period of time was producers in that were, you know, in Canada, at least were tired of waiting till after the 11 o'clock news to go into the TV stations to use their equipment right. and stuff. We, we need a, a post-production place. And they started to grow in, in Toronto. In fact, a lot of them were our clients. So in 1979, a group in, in uh, Vancouver set up, again, three of our old Ampex guys set, set up there. And so uh, for the, about five years, they sort of courted me and we talked about it when they got you know big enough to join them. And I had an opportunity to go to head office in Redwood City. In between, I worked in England and Australia for the, for the company, helping with their management setups of the, of the businesses. So I ended up in Vancouver with this company in 1984. And a funny story I tell. So I went from a, an office bigger than this room that I yeah. am now to a desk drawer. That was my... <laughs> That's all, all they could afford me in this guy's office. I had a share. I had a drawer. That was it. Oh, my God. It was fine with me because I wanted to get away from all the tiering stuff in business. Still appreciation that organization is key in moving forward, and it ended up being our calling card. But we didn't need all this a level. You wanted immediacy. You wanted inter, you know, to contact, especially with clients coming in. So that's how I joined, got into the post-production you know, aspects of it. And back then, we weren't in uh, film or TV at all. We we're in high-end commercial and corporate work. That's where I met Hank, because he worked for Palmer Jarvis. And we did all the post-production for all Palmer Jarvis's video uh, stuff. Oh, well, and that is our mutual friend, That's Hank. our mutual friend, oh, Hank. Hank. Yeah, Big so Hank. That. Big Hank. <laughs> so that's how, you know, we met. So we, like, you know, Peter Drucker says, a famous business guy, you, you got to sometimes take a courageous step as, as you move forward. So I got involved with uh, Vancouver. Mike Harcourt was mayor of Vancouver. Um, Vancouver and L.A. became sister cities. Mm -hmm. This is a con concept that Eisenhower started in 56 to bring down the level of the Cold War challenges around the world. And so we had different cities in the States connecting with different cities around the world. For example, San Francisco is connected to Perth, Australia, their sister cities. Vancouver and LA were natural. So we, we did, and then we helped form the LA Vancouver Sister City Society. And I ended up presiding over it a few years later. But in doing the course of that, I used that as another door so we could start you know, bringing ideas about, hey, when you're coming to Canada and Vancouver, to shoot, don't just shoot and ship. Why don't you stay here and maybe post produce? And our timing was great. Uh, that uh, the new network came on called the Fox Network in the states at the time, and Stephen Cannell uh, had moved over to the Fox Network and said, "Hey, I'm going to shoot these two things in Canada." So we approached him and say, "Hey," and there was a couple of post production facilities there. Why don't we finish them here? Why don't we post produce them? We can do this. And so anyway, uh, right place, right time, we delivered, and we were able to procure uh, 21 Jump Street. And that was uh, our Wow. First and I have up. a, fr I, you know what, this is such a small world. It's so funny to me, yeah. because I think of all the people, like I can remember going down to Canal Production. I remember going in downtown in Vancouver there, that little, it was kind of off the place, and my my very, very good friend was married to a guy that was was a a, a grip and and yep. his dad was uh, uh, so Pierre uh, Hubert and his dad was Jacques Hubert and they were all you know he was Jacques you probably I'm guessing you probably knew Jacques because he did all the d directing and he did uh, what was it called Beachcombers and First well, I mean, Blood I mean, I mean, and he everybody did everybody worked in the Beachcombers at some time yeah <laughs> so many things but I just remember that my girlfriend was on Ju 21 Jump Street and it's sort of funny it's like when you're in Vancouver I was never involved in all of that stuff but so yeah. many people yeah it was such a huge industry it kind of blew up in the 80s and it 90s did. that just all of a sudden everybody was working there yeah it did. And then we, we managed to get together. I think one of the big things we did, getting back to my Ampex story, I remember putting the people there. Yes. I got involved in putting all the groups here, having the unions sitting at, at, at the, the table with us, all the services, the, the legal guys, the post-production <sighs> guys, the accounting guys, uh, the production guys, all sitting around the table because it takes them all to, you know, to do the work. It's show business. You know, the emphasis on is on the word business. And so we 
created what we called then the Community Market Group. Today, it's known as the Motion Picture Production Industry Association of BC. And it's probably one of the strongest ones in the in the world. So it was just wonderful being at the right place at the right time, but with a lot of people that had the same desire. It wasn't about taking your piece of the pie. It was whatever you took out of that pie, make sure you, you chewed it well so there'd be another pie the next year around because the money could move <laughs> quite quite easily. So we were very sensitive to that. So, I, I and that's got to be coming back to that you're a mathematician, right? You're a numbers guy. So if the only way this thing is going to work and mm -hmm. and have sustainability mm -hmm. is that we, you know, if you get a bunch of artists around, we can get a little bit caught up in the in in the creating. Mm -hmm. And and it's really good to have a numbers guy mm -hmm. who is creative as well, who can come and figure out mm -hmm. how to give this thing longevity. I yeah. love well, that. Well, budget was really important to go mm -hmm. to ask the necessary things to organize to put down um, on paper in, in order to meet the creative desires. That's really what, what it's about. So they do work in tandem. Uh, when I, ta I taught a course at UBC called it Creating Your Competitive Edge. Uh, for uh, We had it for the entertainment industry for about uh, nine years and in uh, the one awards right across Canada the whole program was fantastic but it was about you know connecting the necessary evils you know that <laughs> that make up the business it goes beyond just you know filming being in front or being behind the camera and bringing that together but more importantly getting back to one of the things uh, you, you've mentioned before to me is um, you know I guess the way I can say is how can you sell yourself if you don't know yourself so mm. what i would get involved with is actually when you're going up and presenting the marketplace let's say the concept given that there's interest there they wouldn't have met with you but at the end of the day they're not buying this they're investing in you because they believe that you can deliver because it is all about delivery and you got to have that consciousness in yourself, the belief in yourself, and not arrogance, but just a good belief in yourself mm -hmm. to share, you know, what you be really believe you can do and support it. So that's what we are we're working. And that is really, I, I see it in all the people I know. I, I mean, I'm much removed you know, from the industry. I consult, consult in an executive produce a bit now on a couple of passion projects that I'm on. But I see that in these new people, you know, forward and what they've learned. I mean, we we didn't we didn't know a lot of things. It was a good thing because it didn't stop us. You know, we sort of learned a lot along the way. It was right. great. Wow, this is you know, I I, I feel like um, uh, what, what how do I want to say? I hope for myself as I'm listening to this, I'm thinking I feel like I'm getting uh, I, I I'm getting a free consultation here from a from. <laughs> Because these are all true, and what you're saying, right? I mean, it's it's not about arrogance; it's true humility, right? When actual humility is understanding fully what I'm capable of, yeah. and yeah. what I'm not, yeah, and and thriving in those areas. I mean, that's that's what it's about. And so figuring that out, that's so you you were able to figure out how to help people reach that, mm -hmm. yeah, and that was... to the limitations, and when to yeah. when to yeah. encourage them to fly and maybe when to not what it did though it it, it forced them to uh, create what i call a trusted team environment so in this course we exposed them to all the elements in the piece and it doesn't mean you're going to be good at it but it means you recognize and respect it well find somebody who's really good at it <laughs> And yes. have them join your team. No different than your uh, accounting person that you, you talked about before. Because she said, I can trust the numbers. That's fine. You need people that can trust the numbers. That's a good thing. It's yeah. a very good thing. Well, it, it, it's true. And then and then understanding that they'll fit into your team. It's kind of like, you know, uh, putting a band together. And, uh, you know, I might not hire the best whatever fill in the bank blank drummer whatever I, I might not but i would rather work with the person that's best for the team yeah 
whether oh, they're the most exceptional at the thing they do, but that they would be the best fit. And I think that's a little bit of what you're talking about. It is. It is. A, it's. A, it is all about fit. I uh, take two going different ways you know, for a different, you know, chat ch challenge than that. You don't. It's tough enough getting something done. You don't need an <laughs> internal challenge at the same time. Right. It's so true. It's like that. So, so you ended up, so you worked on 21 Jump Street. Mm -hmm. um, you worked on uh, X-Files. Yeah, we did X-Files. We did Millennium as well. And they're, you know, big, big international shows. Yeah. I think one story that, that I think people will find fascinating is, he said, well, how did you get 21 Jump Street to actually, you know, produce you know or have their film you know done here uh you know we had to process it how did that happen well really fascinating uh way the big thing for uh for cannell for stephen j cannell was every morning he'd get up go into this get his donuts and coffee go into the studio at 10 30 to watch the dailies from the day before rushes as they called them you know, from the day before. He says, if you can have them there, you can process the film here in Canada. We'll work with you and we'll talk about, you know, post-producing the show. So how are we going to do that? So what happened was every night with the film would come in, our film processors would come in in the evening and they process the film. And at five o'clock in the morning, they'd be picked up and driven to the airport and beyond what was affectionately known as the fish flight from Vancouver to L.A., picked up in L.A., driven to Hollywood so Cannell could see them uh, for breakfast. I, I remember the first, when we got the job, I remember getting up for a week in the morning, meeting the, the, our driver and driving to the airport and watching it get on a plane and going down there. And uh, just to make so, you know, we made sure that everything was going and it, and it developed a great relationship. Even after 21 Jump Street, we have sort of, you know, Velcro on the door. Here's the next show, you know, like Street Justice or some of the other shows came in. We had, we had developed a great relationship because we delivered. And so our whole focus was we were as good as the last foot of film that went out the door. And that's right. why we had to look at everything. Wow. So it's. And, and and in this business, as a guy said to me in the States, because he ended up making great connections with other people there, help us out in the States. Uh, it's quite a community. He says, uh, you know, you, you know, you'll survive in this business. You'll be as good as this business, as good as you can take the stuff that's thrown at you. Yeah. And it's that's so true. It's so true. I remember we're doing 21 Jumps, just our first year, and it's going great. We've got two shows in the can. Remember, this was back in when September was the opening you know, season for all the networks. And, right, right. And That's we're right. Getting up. So we got first two done. We're working on post production in the next three, and it's moving along great. Some genius phones us from LA and says, Okay, uh, episode five is going to be episode one. So in, so in 48 hours, we had to turn around and, and, and get episode five as one into the can. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And, and, and you know what's funny? I, I love the smile on your face and the little, little twinkle in your eyes thinking about it because what comes to me right now is, you know, there's the, the, the story of the little kid and, and the parents walk in and this there's a mound of manure and this little kid is sitting there and he has this shovel and they're like, what are you looking so happy? And he says, with all this crap in there, there's this got to be a pony. <laughs> right on. <laughs> Right on. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what a great story. My dad told me that story when I was 15 years old. I mean, you know, what you just told me. Yeah. Yes. And it's still, yeah. you the know, story what it's about still... the optimist and pessimist. Yeah. Yes. And it's still yeah. true, right? It's, it's, it is. it's the, the whole thing. It's, there's, because in life, the whole, you know, it's funny. I'll say, I wrote my book during COVID too, right? So I have a, I have a, where it's around here somewhere. I don't know if I'll find it. That's okay. But I, I, um, I'd started like you, you know what I mean? I'd had this beginning that it was going to start, but how I came up with the concept for Find Your Joy was this. I'd been a co-author, so I had 
my accident, life was pretty, you know, unpleasant for about three years going through all that stuff. Yeah. And I was trying to figure out, well, what am I going to do? You know, I, 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 I just wasn't, I was at that time, I was still in my fifties. I wasn't really prepared to just do nothing, which was right. sort of was the prognosis. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm only, it, the truth is I'm only so great at something for oh, but the wheels start to come off the bus at about an hour. I can't yep. track anymore, but that, but I have a great hour and, yep. and it, you know, and, and, and so I was a, a co-author in these three different books that were, you know, there's a theme and you talk about challenges and then how you overcome them. And, and that's great. Those are, they were great books and I was happy to be, and I learned a lot in those. And then I was starting to do my own book and I was, you know, it was on trauma, right? It's a little hard to be happy and peppy just writing about trauma, but I, it, but the shift came for me when I said, I I can't write one more thing about all these, you know, the sad, sad story and then save a little bit at the end for the turnaround. If, if, if it can't be about finding joy, I, I just would rather not write it. I mean, now I'm going on, I'm doing children's books. So that's fine. Everything, you know, that's a whole different thing. But, but in, I just, I said to my publisher at the time, I can't, I can't do it. I don't, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to write about that. So my book changed from, you know, being about forgiveness and things like that too. And it's called, um, oh gosh, I don't know, what's it called? <laughs> <laughs> the art of healing trauma, um, finding joy through creativity, spirituality, and forgiveness. Oh, I nice. needed to shift it into that. So how yeah. did, you know, how did painting help me? How did music help us? How did other people's stories are in there? I talk a little bit about it. And, and that was, and then, fr and that's how this was birthed because then there was COVID was going on and, and I just, it's, there was so much unhappiness and, and, and I get it, right. It, yeah. you know, there's, there is a lot of unhappiness and I just, I believe in my heart with everything in me that if we can find the joy in whatever it is, I'm not, you know, I, cancer sucks and, and bankruptcy yeah. sucks and divorce sucks, but I guarantee there's going to be a moment of joy. And if you can just scramble for that, if you can just find that and go for it and don't let go, mm -hmm. then that's the place. And I, and when I, when I'm listening to the things that you had to do, like, yeah, you had to get up and you had to be up late and then get up early and make sure. And actually visually I can mm -hmm. see, I'm guessing you were a rather intent making sure that thing got on that plane because it's easy you know, it's like a shell game, right? Wow, where's the ball? Where's the ball? You know, to physically make sure that that happened. Yeah. But you did it. Yeah. Yeah, we're, you know, again, fortunate. And a lot of good people there. And and I think that's one of the big thing is, is the 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 you is a is a is a huge group it's you know goes right from the set getting it to us and we're, we're sort of like the last link you know in post-production processing that film having people that have the ability to work in the dark in order to process stuff getting it together and make sure that uh, the guy's there to you know take it there there's a lot of moving parts yeah in this industry even today i mean it's a little easier and i say that in quotes a bit because right. of the because of the digital aspects of it, now we can, we can have production studios pretty much anywhere because we're just shooting uh, digital pieces, you know, over the net to uh, various uh, post-production facilities, for example, or audio facilities. So right. that's been a big uh, breakthrough. And that's why more and more, you know, is being done today and it's created more and more opportunity. Who would have known we're in a three to four, you know, billion dollar industry here in British Columbia like it, it's phenomenal and another thing a lot of people don't know about British Columbia and it was another area that I got early days involvement in is the area of animation you know there's more animators here in Vancouver than there is in LA wow that's uh it's an animation that's category. exciting because I'm going to turn my books into cartoons I'm sure of it <laughs> yeah well yeah, car and and cartoons still sell because they're a form yeah. of escape. They yeah, I actually they have work. two nieces. Uh, one uh, is an animator for Disney, and she's in Vancouver. Well, there you go. 
Yeah. So, I mean, it's just, it, it, there's, it, it's, it's, it's incredible. And what I love about it is that people, you know, you have the, like, who would have thought I wouldn't, okay. I wouldn't have thought, let me just say that. I'll let me clarify this. I might not have thought walking down the hall of York university at a young man that was sitting there, um, you know, working the, taking tests and writing papers on mathematics. Yeah. I might not have thought, let's drop him into Vancouver and the film industry and let him be part of what actually birthed that whole incredible, that's yeah. the beauty of it. You just it, don't know. You don't know. And and sometimes what you, yeah, it's not about you don't know won't hurt you, but you don't know may help you. So yeah, yeah like, oh, Boy, isn't yeah. that the truth? And yeah. staying curious and being open and yeah. all of those, because I, the curiosity in your mind to be a guy that went from a mathematician into. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I know. To, to go from that, uh, but it wasn't, it really wasn't that, you know, much of a a, a stretch. And, uh, and then music had nothing to do with it. Uh, it was just always my escape piece. So I never thought, you know much about it till i started writing these are actually therapy pieces for me i write, write one a week takes me about an hour and checking up but they're they're great and i know i've got a great sense of accomplishment and i'm i'm waiting to see you know how people you know react to them when they come out yeah so I, I i i even post them freely on on my facebook page and that and i'm happy to set you up on that and you can oh perfect you, you, you'll get an idea of uh, how the how the stories uh work and you'll be i think uh, quite humbly that you'll be fascinated by some of them going really that's how you know that's how it happened but yeah and truth is stranger than fiction that it definitely comes out <laughs> in the entertainment <laughs> industry that I is mean, so true yeah and and it's a it's a tough business um the entertainment industry is a tough business especially on the production side on the on the post side or the production services side the the, the necessary evils that i often call it of the business there is always work. Now, I may not be with production company A, B, and C, but now I'm working with D, E, and F, or I'm working with GH. So there's always something coming in for us as opposed to, hey, we've got nothing on our slate or nothing's been greenlit by telefilm. You know, what do we do now? You know, you keep pitching all the time. So the production side's pretty precarious to me. It is. And as an executive producer, I, I see it more so because it's it's blending, you know, the right money you know, with the right concept. And that's not that easy. Oh. <laughs> okay. My little brain is working. <laughs> <laughs> you might just be my first call <laughs> when my books are ready to do something. <laughs> I could, well, it's funny because I, I've uh, flipped a lot of my, you know, how to market and, and present, you know, in, in the marketplace. 50%, you know, in writing a book is the actual writing, editing, and getting it down right. But the success comes from getting out there or using your connections in, in, in the marketplace. You know, how, how, how can you go forward? How, how do you, you know, make it make it happen? There's a number of ways. Social media is great and all that stuff. But there's, that's nothing beats one to one. One thing I didn't have during the COVID time was the opportunity to stand in front of 100, 150 people and, yes. and talk about the magic of music and how it affected them because it was something they could all relate to. And then having the back of the room open up for people who maybe want to pick up a copy of the book before they headed yes. out. And I think those are still, you know, very powerful. The other thing is, is thinking about what can you do with the book? You know, care facilities, uh, adult uh, community centers, and stuff like oh, that are yeah. great places for, for presentation and going out and, and sharing, you know, fun time and a, a time of enjoyment, if, if yes. you will, in, in the marketplace. Everybody wins. I, I get a kick out of talking about it. So that it's fine. So it's not even like working when you're doing stuff, you know, in, in that vein can help help someone out. And it's really a lot of the things that we, we work on is a mindset. I was very curious you know, listening and you talking about your book, you say, no, I can't write it that way. I got to flip this around to a positive way. So when my dad, for the three or four years that I, I dealt with Alzheimer's and I changed, you know, going to see him every day from a chore to an event. Yes. And then, and then I would, and I really, when he passed, I, I wrote a piece for caregivers and I talked mm -hmm. about, and because a lot of funny things, 
you know, do happen during those period yes. of time. It's respectful. We do it. Play, the thing has been around the world. It was kind of a neat thing that I did in the Alzheimer's of BC published it for their caregivers. But the whole concept, what I'm, I'm getting to is turning some challenges, you know, into opportunities, but chores into events mm. is a very simple way of doing it because for an event, you're up right, you're in, it's showtime, right? And exactly, me, you approach that in, in everything you do. It, it's incredible how enjoyable it really is, and how your sensory buttons work because you'll be more attentive. Yes, yeah. That well, though, no, that now those are some powerful, wonderful words of advice, and and uh, I love that. Well, clearly, it's worked for you. Yeah, so, uh, that yeah, a beautiful yeah. career. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Or, or you have I, ha, had as if it's all past tense. Yeah, That's like not what's keep, going on. I like keep going. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Like, so the old story really wants to go to heaven, but not right now. Yeah. So. <laughs> That's exactly. Well, it's. <laughs> I have so many things running through my mind right now, but it was just I was I was thinking about you know I'm just uh, I have this this practice that I, that I'm doing, like opening this practice of, of doing sound healing and, and, and uh, creative art play and mm -hmm. things like that. And then I started to think I'm turning 65 this year. Should, is this what I'm supposed to be doing? Starting this like whole new thing. And, and then I thought, you know, you never even doubted it until you thought about the age thing. Why did you do that for? Like, it, it, you're just doing this thing because it's what I do. It's because now I can, okay. I couldn't before yeah. and I can only yeah. do it for a little time, but I can do it. And yeah. it's a, it it's just keeps us alive and it keeps us happy and engaged. And it's, um, wow, what a yeah. life you've, you, what keeping a life you lead. Engaged is key. Yeah, it really, it really, really is. is. Keeping engaged and, and, and on top of things. And, and I think the other thing that comes out, uh, with, there's so much more uh, introspection, you know, at, as we get get older. But the, the, a lot of true enjoyment comes from giving other people enjoyment. Yes. There's you know? it's so true. Isn't that the truth? Wow. Well, Tom, thank you. Thank you so much. I what a gift. This is this this is a gift for me, a gift for the listeners. I I really appreciate that you've taken the time to come and just share a little bit about the really incredible, interesting life that you are leading and the places that you've been and the things that you've seen and created it's it's a lot and and i hope that it'll be an inspiration for those you know mm. of all ages to go out there and find the thing find mm. the thing that inspires you and do that thing yeah. yeah 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 do what you love love what you do and give more than you promise oh well that's a good place to end Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great day. Yeah, you too. And this is Allie. And thank you all for tuning in. I really appreciate that. I know life gets busy and I appreciate that you would spend some time with us here today. Do remember to find your joy. Thanks so much for joining me today. If you found a piece of your joy in this episode, I would love to hear about what came up for you so that we can continue to grow the impact of this show. Thanks again. See you soon. And remember, find your joy. Thank you.